Welcome everybody to the Troubadour podcast. Today we're going to talk about lust and William Shakespeare. Now that may not be how you perceive William Shakespeare, and that's why I want to cover this poem. The poem is Sonnet 129, The Expense of Spirit in a Waste of Shame by William Shakespeare. Now, before we get into it, I want to cover one new aspect, maybe even two aspects of poetry that even unless you've really studied it, you probably don't know or you're not super familiar with them. It can very much help in understanding what poetry does and why it's so impactful. So one of the important things that poetry adds and what literature adds to our lives is in shaping, giving meaning to the ideas of our life, the emotions of our life, our lives itself, experiences. We do this all the time as humans when we, and we expect it and we're more attuned to shape and to the shape of things than you may, you know, even be aware of consciously. When you look at a piece of um, marketing material, like when you're watching a commercial or you're, you know, you're not even aware of that there is a shape there. When you watch a TV show, obviously, or a movie, there's shape in how it's structured, beginning, middle, and end, but there's also structure in how they show certain elements of the character at certain points, and they give you certain bits of information. And we all know that person at the party who tells a story, and there's no shape to it. It doesn't seem like it's going anywhere, and you don't know why you're listening, and you don't, and it's very confusing. And even if you like the person and you want to hear more, you're very lost, and you're like, wait a second, what are you talking about? And it, you know, there's there, there's that joke from The Office. You know, let me start at the beginning. No, wait, wait, let me start before that. Let me go back even farther. That's the person who doesn't understand shape and, and bringing order to our experiences, to um, our lives. And art in particular is artifice, artificial. That Those words are, you know, have the same cogenem or, or root or whatever uh, for a reason. And the um, what we're looking at with a sonnet and what's really good about studying sonnets, especially Petrarchan and Shakespeare sonnets, is because they are very tight. They have a very specific structure. It's not a sonnet if it doesn't have, uh, it's not a Shakespearean sonnet if it doesn't have uh, four quatrains and a, a couplet at the end. Ah, so, <laughs> sorry, sorry, three quatrains and a couplet at the end. So that's a quatrain is the first thing I wanted to talk about today. Um, and it may help you in even deciphering poetry, whether you're doing it for fun or for a class, um, you know, it could be very helpful to you. But a quatrain, so before I even read this, I'm actually going to show you um, this image here. This is a quatrain. It's four lines. This is the actual poem by Shakespeare. It's um, four lines, and you could see there is also a rhyme scheme within these four lines, shame, lust, blame, trust. That's every other line, shame, blame, lust to trust. So the, or, so it's the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust and action until action. Lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. And then the next four are going to be, another stanza or excuse me, another quatrain. And then the third quatrain. And then you see these two indented couplets or a couplet. Now, the reason I wanted to show that to you before I read it, was just so you have an idea of form and structure and that these aren't arbitrary and there is something he's trying to do. So each quatrain often in a Shakespearean sonnet you'll find that there is a dominating idea or metaphor that he's bringing out in that particular um, uh, quatrain. And sometimes he'll build on it, or sometimes he'll be kind of a cue, you know, like a call and answer type thing, or it'll be like a case that he's going to be making. Like we saw, if you watch the, the episode I did on uh, another Shakespearean sonnet, sonnet 18, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? And he's, he had different metaphors about comparing this beautiful woman to a summer's day. And he made a kind of argument for why she was more beautiful, what was negative about the summer's day that we don't often think about. So that, but each quatrain tends to have its own dominant metaphor, analogy, 
uh, simile, something of those of the, that nature. It's kind of having an idea. And then the couplet at the end is kind of going to sh- explain all the other and make you look through the whole, everything you just read. It's going to make you look at it differently. It's going to give you a kind of um, key is how I look at it to unlock the other metaphors and understanding it, which is why I always say that poems are not meant to be read, but reread. There is no meaning in the moment when you're first listening to it, even sometimes the second or third time. It's only after you kind of take stock of what it all means together uh, that you can sort of get a, a grip on it, which is why when you're first getting started with Poetry it does help to start with shorter poems because you could see it more clearly in a short poem versus a big poem. Um, and, and oftentimes big long poems or epic poems aren't exact. They don't do it in this exact way. Uh, and they don't, they don't give you meaning in this exact way. It's a little bit differently. Okay. So let's um, read this poem. This is a poem. I'm going to just tell you the theme. It's about lust or sex devoid of spirit. And we're, you know, this is the great love poet. He is considered one of the great romance poets, not romance in the uh, term that I use it in the 18th century, 19th century romantic English poets. He came much before them. Shakespeare's in the 1500s. But he is r- writing about love. He, he has some of the best love poems that we know of. Um, some of his poems are quoted and read all the time during weddings. Like there's certain poems that people use that are, they you go to a wedding. It's a good chance you'll hear, you know, the marriage of true minds type uh, poem, uh, which is a Shakespeare poem. So there, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, love poems and he's very pro love, but we're going to get something really different. And it'd be interesting if you, you know, to think about if we haven't heard of Shakespeare, if we don't have all these connotations and views and emotions about who he is, and we haven't seen the movie Shakespeare in love, that we, um, if we only read this poem, then we would get a um, really weird and, and like a very different view of who Shakespeare is. And it'll also bring up a finale question about art itself and about poetry and what we can glean from it. But let's read this poem. And if you're watching, I'm going to pop up the words on the screen. If you're listening, Uh, I'm going to read the poem, of course, and that way you can follow along. But you can go to troubadourmag.com and read it there as well, if you'd like. Okay, so here is the poem, Sonnet 129. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And till action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, Full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner but despised straight, past reason hunted. And no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit and in possession so had having and in quest to have extreme, a bliss in proof and proved, a very woe, before a joy proposed behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. Okay, so as always, if you got about 2% of that in terms of understanding it. Great. You're on the right track. <laughs> That's perfect. So, um, you know, now we're going to go through it again and kind of get some, we're going to look at the quat trains. We're going to look at the line by line, um, each, each of these lines to see what we're getting out of it. I always I say it, it's handy to have a, um, hold this up here. Handy to have a, phone or, um, cause I have the dictionary Oxford American dictionary app, you know, having, if, if, by the way, if anybody has a good recommendation for a good dictionary app, let me know. Um, obviously the old dictionaries I think are better in general. If you have one of those really, you know, 1940s dictionaries or, uh, you know, before that of English dictionary, it could be very useful to understanding these words even better 
than I think these apps do. But at least the apps can give you a kind of guidance and you can just, you have your phone with you all the time anyway, so why not just use it? So, you know, let's think about what we're talking about here in this first line. The expense of spirit and a waste of shame. <laughs> and that is a pretty powerful opening statement. What's he talking about? Well, this is a sentence, right? We have a predicate coming up, is lust in action. So we're talking about lust, right? Lust in action. And what is lust in action? What is this thing? It's the expense of spirit. So if we, we know what the word lust means, right? It's either we're talking about sex and we're talking about a particular type of sex. We all know that there's a difference between lust and love or any adult knows there's a difference between lust and love that, um, you know, lust can feel really good. It, we, there's a lot of cliches and it can, you know, most, um, somebody just told me a term recently, NRE, new relationship energy. <laughs> and I think lust is, um, kind of manifested in that view of new relationship energy. And it's the desire for sex that, you know, the, like the extreme desire for sex. And what is he saying about this? And, and he's saying lust in action. So lust in action is either and the act of trying to have sex with somebody and the act of sex for, for lust. So we have to keep that in mind that it's always on this element of this is about lust, not about love. Because you can have a poem that's about love and sex, you know, and having sex as a fulfilling, rewarding act of love. And you can also have it where it's this fulfilling or this, this draining, you know, act of um, sex for the sake of sex. And I think that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about the expense of spirit. So if you think about it from a male's perspective, this is from the male's perspective, there, there is that feeling of expense of spirit. Like you're putting all this energy out in the world. You're trying to enact this thing, this activity, you have, you finally have the activity. And then there's like that draining moment. And there's even, you know, kind of physical connotation that goes along with the expense of spirit as though, you know, the, the, um, the, the climax of sex, I won't go get too graphic here. The climax of sex is kind of the, the spirit and, and, you know, um, gone out of you and, um, and, and maybe even put into another person in a sense. And, but this is not a positive view of this. We have to keep that in mind because the expensive spirit in a waste of shame. Now, whether we want to take this, you know, I, I think this is rightfully taken as a negative hit toward women, you know, that as well as men, I think this is actually both, you know, I think a lot of people might consider it completely misogynist as, as though he's saying something about the woman being shameful, but I think it's, it's both in this case are shameful that, that it let this happen, this act of lust again, not love. We're talking about just pure sex for its own sake. And you know, the word expense is a really important one to look up, even if you already know it. So the word expense, of course, we know, um, we could, we could think of it as like the expenses, like your bills that you have to pay. So that's another thing is, is this is something that you're paying, you're paying with your spirit for this lust in action. And it's in a waste of shame. So, you know, like a place, like a location, this waste of shame that these two people are in this bed. Maybe you could think the, think of this gross bed that they just, you know, made disgusting and, um, you know, in this act of lust. Okay, so let's let's move on. Um, so so think about the expense, like the spending money on something, like like uh, paying a bill, paying your rent, you know. And the the monetary equivalent here is spirit. Until action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Now, by the way, when you see a great poet do action in two two words, uh, the same word on uh, repeating the word on the same line, that's done intentionally. There are no, there are no mistakes in a Shakespearean sonnet. Um, so we have less than action until act and till action. So, you know, when I was saying before less than action meant the act of trying to have sex and the act of sex, I think I probably spoke too soon. I think it's uh, after the semicolon that you get that, you know, action of sex. And, and that's a good grammatical, structural, formal way, form way of 
showing you what he's trying to talk about without just saying it the way that a prose writer might say it. The two wanted to have, you know, this is how a prose writer might write something straightforward. A pro, the, the man wanted to have sex with the woman. He, he chased after her and he had sex with the woman, right? Instead, this poet is using the um, grammar, the actual punctuation as a way to show you that there's a, a disjunction between the, the uh, like a, a disjoint or a moment of stopping and on both sides visually where you have lust in action on one side, you have you know lust in action right over here, lust in action if you're watching the video on this side. And that is the desire for lust or for sex. And then until action, and then you have the actual action of sex on the other side. And he's actually using grammar as like a, a there's like a little line in this case, a, a semicolon that's giving you that visual cue and the verbal cue of what it, um, you know, what he's saying about the pursuit of sex and then the act of sex, right? So what is that? That whole sequence is the expensive spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action until action. And, that, and then they, that's the two sides of that coin. And then he has a comma and then he's going to have the next se sequence. Lust is perjured. Now think about what perjured means. Perjured means you know, uh, untruth. It's telling a lie in court often, you know, you, you can't perjure yourself in court or, or you shouldn't perjure yourself in court by lying and then being caught in a lie. Right. And that's what he's saying. And what he's saying is that there's a lie to lust. Lust is perjured. There, there's a lie to it. Like the very nature of it. Well, what is the lie? And, and one way to think about this is the way that, we might tell ourselves that what we are pursuing is more than lust. It's, Oh, it's no, I love the person and you may. And, and so the, how many times, I mean, think about this for yourself and you don't have to answer this, of course, you answer this for yourself, but how many times have you, if you're a sexually active person told yourself that you really had strong feelings for this person and you later thought back on it and you th said, nah, I was just trying to get, have sex. <laughs> I was just, just trying to have sex. That's it. There's nothing else. There's nothing. There's nothing. No, nothing really there between us. We don't really have anything in common, really. It was just pure sex, and that's what he's saying. He's saying lust is perjured, and he's also not. He keeps going though with this, um, these kind of adjectives: murderous, bloody, full of blame, right? So this, all, we now get a feeling for what he thinks of lust. He's not. It's not a pretty picture. Savage, extreme, rude cruel not to trust enjoyed no sooner but despised straight now if you think about what in your mind follows despised straight what's the next word in your head but despised straight after right enjoyed no sooner but despised straight after this is one of the great things that poetry can do is it it actually uses what's already in your head which is why it's so important to engage with poetry rather than just um, read it and then walk away from it. You have to really engage with it, ask questions. So what is he saying here is lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. I mean, these are things like you might say after um, you feel you, you maybe uh, you, you feel taken away from this. You feel this negative thing. Maybe you have pursued as a, let's say as a male, you've pursued sex and you gained it and realized that you destroyed another relationship in it, right? It was rude and cruel or not to trust. And you, you trusted your lust that it would take you in the right direction. And it didn't, it took you in the wrong direction. Okay. Let's go. So that's one quatrain. Let's go into the next quatrain. Now in that quatrain, by the way, the, the one we just covered, I would say the main metaphor, the main thing he's talking about is the act and of pursuit and sex. Like that's the meta, that's the idea going on here. And, um, you know, the, the key I would take away is the expensive spirit. That first line is setting this whole thing up. And what is that expensive spirit? That that's the, the monetary, um, compensation recompense for this, um, act of sex. So all you're getting out of sex in this first, uh, quatrain, all you get out of it is, a loss of your spirit. That's it. 
and you get nothing out of it. So it's perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. So th that's what I think happening in this first quat train, these first one, two, three, four lines. Or I should say I, I kind of uh, went a little bit ahead uh, when I said enjoy no sooner, but still the same kind of thing. So the, here's the, the next quatrain starts with enjoyed no sooner, but despised straight away past reason hunted. So that that's an interesting way to phrase that past reason hunted. And I think this is my take on it. You know, what do you think? I think what he's talking about is again, after we've acted this out, we've had sex, we will often look back on the, the pursuit and rationalize it. We will give reasons. We will hunt around for reasons for why we did this. Now he's going to play on this hunting fishing uh, metaphor here. So, and he, I'm going to continue with the stanza or with the, the poem. And no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait on purpose laid to make the taker mad. So when we have this swallowed bait idea, this is again the past reason hunted. Past reason hunted, there is there's a feeling of swallowed bait. Well, what is a bait, right? You 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 plop your your um, fishing hook in the water. It's got its little worm on it, and the fish goes up to get it, right? The fish takes an action, bites that that thing, and it's hooked in the mouth, right? And then you pull it up and you gut it and you eat it. You're in the fish is dead. So it bait for the person being baited is not good. It's not good to be baited. You know, it means that you're expensing your spirit. It means you, there's the murderous bloody full of shame from metaphor from quant train one that we're seeing here. And it's going to make someone mad and not necessarily mad. And like I'm angry, but mad is that I'm crazy. Right. And, and so we, we kind of all can also, I think sympathize. Hopefully I'm not, you know, um, hopefully other people, other guys have the same experience as me. I've had conversations with this uh, other guys. I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in this. And I'm just here talking about my own, you know, quirkiness and weirdness. But there is a feeling of when you're, especially when you're younger, I guess, but you know, when you're, you're pursuing lust, when you're in that pursuit of lust, that it is a kind of madness. And it's kind of like taking away, you know, you, you ignore all consequences, all reality. You don't care about anything. It's like, ah, I'll just leave my car here. No, I don't care. You know, I'll get the, I don't care how expensive this is. You know, I'm going to just flop down and let me just pay for everything. Let's get at it. Like, you know, you just, all reality drops while you're trying to pursue, um, you know, sex in that, in that moment, you're kind of, you've gone mad, Like you've lost contact with reality. It doesn't matter what's going on. You don't care who you piss off. Like, oh, I'm going to leave my friend over here because there's a girl there I'm going to try to chase after, right? It, it just, you've, got, you've gone crazy. You've gone mad. And that's um, the second quatrain. And I think the main metaphor there is the hunted metaphor. Now, the next quatrain, one, two, three, four here, that starts with um, mad, again, you know, and I, I think, again, think crazy, but you can also think angry. I think both could work because there is a kind of ferocity Mad in pursuit and in possession. So again, you're crazy in the pursuit. You're crazy in when, when you're having it, having sex, that is. Um, so had having and in quest to have, he's really emphasizing these verbs of accomplishing the act. And in doing that, it's extreme. Had having and in quest to have extreme. So he, he wants to emphasize the fact that when you're pursuing lust as a man, especially you've gone mad, you do, you'll do anything to have sex and you go to extremes and it's extreme emotion. And this is part of what he's talking about when he talks about these extreme, um, you know, adjectives and descriptors for sex or for lust, perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame, savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust despised, right? He's talking over and over again. He's giving you these descriptors of what he's talking about with lust. That is not good here. <laughs> it's very, very bad. And he, he's emphasizing this even in having it, it's fine. And then the next two lines are very interesting because these are the last two lines of this last quatrain. And he, he talks about proof improved. And, you know, we have to think about mathematics in this case. So I'm going to just give you a hint when he talks about proof improved, he's talking about mathematics. That's, those are mathematical, you know, geometrical pro, um, um, terms. And he says, here are the last two lines of this quatrain. A bliss in proof and proved, a very woe. 
before a joy proposed behind a dream. So if you're thinking about it in terms of, if you're thinking about it in terms of the um, geometrical, you know, the mathematical equation here, then what we're, we're seeing here is he's saying that nobody can argue, like you can build a case that uh, lust is great. In fact, the Romans uh, and the Greeks did. They made a case that lust, you know, sex for its own sake was a good thing. And they had Bacchanals and these orgies were a big part of Roman and, and Gre Greco-Roman culture. And, it, you know, it, a bliss in proof, you know, there is a bliss, there, which, you know, a bliss, I think, emphasizes a kind of momentary joy. The like joy is very momentary. You know, it, it, it's fleeting. It's only during the act of sex. And then right after it, there is a woe, a very woe. So he's saying that there is no argument against the bliss, the, the carnal pleasure of sex and, you know, of lust and enacting sex. You can't argue against it because it is. We all know it. It's, it's metaphysically true. It's part of our nature that having the, you know, enjoying that con carnal pleasure is pleasurable. It's just that is pleasure. There's, there's nothing else to say about it. It's a bliss before it's a joy proposed. So before this, this act happens, it's a joy. And then behind it, it becomes this dream. And then he has this last two, uh, uh, this last couplet, it's two lines. And this kind of will give you the whole, you know, picture here. All this. So everything he just said, right? All this, the world well knows Yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. So you really get his feelings about lust here. Now, here are a couple um, questions, and, and hopefully those last, that last couplet made sense. I think it's pretty straightforward that everyone knows this. this what I'm telling you is as known today to people in 2020 as it was in the 1500s, that everybody knew lust leads to this kind of misery or can lead and often does if you pursue sex for its own sake. It doesn't fulfill you. It leaves you guilty and woe-ridden. Th that was true then as it is now. And yet men, it's still something that men pursue and it leads men to a hell. And that, I think, gives you the key to everything that's going on. There is a kind of anger at the self, at the male part of him that is going after this, that is uncontrollable in a sense. There is a kind of, this is something that to, to shun the heaven that that leads men to this hell. Yet none knows well to shun the, the heaven that leads men to this hell. Everybody knows this. Men can't control it in particular. And um, I think when you look at everything he's trying to say, it's a very negative view of lust. But I think it also emphasizes other poems of his. So this is a poem that if you take by itself, you just get, it's, it's powerful in terms of this is what lust is. Lust is this very negative thing. It's bad. And, you know, here's a kind of ordered feeling and, and uh, with metaphors and all the, the uses of language, including the form of it, that gives you this clear picture of the negative aspects of sex without sex, you know, the way I would phrase it is sex devoid of spiritual love, right? There, Because there is a zero sum game happening here. He's losing his experience into this waste of shame. And that's what you can think of. Um, that's one way to think about sex is that it, you're kind of giving up a part of yourself, male or female, and you're getting nothing in return, right? And that's part of what you might see in love poems where there's kind of an equal recompense and there's a spiritual connection between the two. And then sex becomes something much more meaningful where, you know, set you expend spirit and you receive a new spirit in return type thing. Right. And so there's a, there's kind of give and take in that sense, but in this sense and just one sided, you know, only uh, sex without uh, any kind of love, that is his argument. And what he's trying to say is how negative it is. And he uses very powerful Shakespearean language to explain how horrible um, lust is, or at least how damaging it can be. And I think that is part of what poetry can do 
in terms of giving you a clear idea of an experience of, of, you know, in this case, I think it's just a moment of Shakespeare's life that he captured this emotion he felt. So here's the final question to think about. Even if you're not a Shakespeare expert, you know, I'm sure you've heard some Shakespeare before and you can listen to my podcast. I did one other po- poem so far on him. Do you think that this um, view that he explains is his view of sex as a human being? Or is it just this feeling he's had in a part, in, in some experience he's, he's experienced, he's had? And I think I've already kind of indicated my own view on this, but I think in, in contemplating that question, it helps you understand what art could do. Because art can clarify a moment that you, you know, of, of an emotional experience that you have and give it to you, give it, return it to you, the emotion, right? You, you've, you had sex and you feel drained from this sexual relationship and you look at this poem and it sums it all up for you and you're like, yes, that's what I was, that's the emotion in words that I was thinking and feeling at that moment. I just couldn't put it. All I could say is, I hate this, right? Shakespeare can put it in this beautiful sonnet that encapsulates that experience. Okay. So that's Sonnet 129, The Expense of Spirit and a Waste of Shame. And I will see you next time.